problem. Um, yeah, I, I get to that. Um, so yeah, so when I moved from Germany to Sweden, I was uh, already uh, in my mid age, the 35. And my uncle said, Oh, Sweden is just a suburb of Germany or of Hamburg. <laughs> Meaning for him, it's no big deal to actually immigrate to Sweden. But wow, uh, I was in shock. So I'll, uh, that was a pretty much a big move. And I do believe it was the preparation already when I then moved to Kenya. Uh, and I'll tell you later a little bit. So the session will also be about me sharing my perception. That does mean I'm right. And there is no right or wrong. I will share my perception that might not necessarily resonate with you. And I will also share my experiences. And my style is also, I will take it with a pinch of humor. So already a disclaimer, please uh, do not get offended if I make fun of my own culture or of someone else's culture. I will try to make it decent, but that's part of how I facilitate. Yes, so um, I love that we have different... Um, we have Kuwait, we have uh, UK, we have Greece, Hungary. So um, pretty much the middle of the EMEA countries, I can see uh, apart from Mark, you're from Canada. And um, yeah, all right, good. Let me start sharing my screen. So how will this will go? Uh, we'll start um, giving you a little bit of context and mainly I will, uh, go back to the research of Erin Mayer, who's um, done um, the culture map. It's uh, actually, everyone should read this book. It's amazing. Uh, and there are different methodologies. I've chosen this one because I find it very, very relatable. Um, so I will give a little bit of theoretical background and then there's going to be a little bit of a reflection at the end. So, um, yeah, uh, housekeeping and introductions we've done. Um, now, oh, sorry. Um, framing culture is a, is a bullet, like setting the contents, a little bit of basics around culture, what it is. And then mainly we'll go into culture mapping and understanding different scales uh, that I think are relevant for the profession that we are in, meaning, um, coaching in the wider context. And then we will reflect on how is culture impacting our coaching relationships. Yeah. So the objective is basically um, explore different models, um, ever, uh, awareness about key cultural traits, and how that plays an important role in coaching. And in, with coaching, I mean, supervision, mentoring, coaching, um, all of that. And, and sh uh, yeah, sharing experiences, and so on. So I will start with the cultural iceberg, which is a model that has been uh, created by Edward Hall. And if you see culture as an iceberg, there's this part of an iceberg that's above the water, so that's visible, and the part of the iceberg that's below the water. And below the water is usually not so vi visible, um, and it's hard to observe, harder to observe. It needs to be more exploring, needs to be diving into, um, and it's harder to change. So 90% of a culture is not visible and 10% is visible. So I would like to ask the group, and you can either shout it out or put it in the chat, what do you think is above the iceberg? What's observable, easily observable? The way people look. The way people look. Maybe mm -hmm. language. Language. The way people are living. Mm -hmm. Food, maybe. Once again? Like pe what, what people eat, food. Food, yes, food. Uh-huh, great. That's yeah. me. <laughs> Music. Uh, Names. Names. Thank you, Claire, for doing what you're doing. <laughs> yep. What Dance. else? Dance. Dance, yes. Uh, 
I, I don't know. What about social norms, like how people greet each other and things like that? Mm-hmm. Yep. Meaning of the yes. Say that again, please. The meaning of, of a yes. Yes. Uh, physical distance. I'm, I'm actually uh, looking at the chat. Language, music, mannerism. Uh, how people greet each other, relate to each other, take decisions, uh, organize themselves, physical distance, directness and indirectness of speech, clothing, hairstyle, celebrations. Yes. Very correct. All right. And now what do you think is below the iceberg? Which, what is harder? to observe and needs to be uncovered by exploring. History of the country people are from. Values, history. I'm not sure which side of the line, but maybe some etiquette. Etiquette, yes, I think that can be um, both sides. Uh, it is from, imagine you're traveling to a country you have never been. In a short time, what is easily observable and what needs a little bit of longer time being there, living, and so on? So if you're just there for a weekend trip, that would be something that is easily observable. Mm -hmm. Sense of time, beliefs, yes, expectations. Also laws, for example, belief, tolerance, tolerance of others. View of life, yeah. So because of time, I will disclose, if you're okay with that. There you go. There is a lot more. This is what I picked up. Problem solving, vision, body language. Body language obviously is something that is um, observable, but not always understandable. Um, and I give you an example. In the Maasai culture, holding the head down for kids is a form of respect. Now, when my dear professor was here, who was an old school German professor building a Maasai school, I observed um, how he would put, you know, he would put his hand, a, a child was going like this while he was talking. So he's putting his hand under the chin and saying, in our culture, we look each other in the eye to show respect. So obviously this is not the, the best um, way of um, experiencing culture, but this is how the differences are in its very um, extreme form. Role of family, yeah, gender. What's the role of the women, the role of the um, men, respect, perceptions, core values, money. Um, yeah, so these are all underneath um, the iceberg and informing our cultural traits. Um, and now, uh, ha, okay. Um, I'm going over, yes, thank you. I'm going over and I need to move, sorry, I need to move a little bit here so I can actually see what I've been typing. So these, this is the core uh, model of Erin Mayer, who has come up with eight scales that define a culture. And these eight scales are these eight scales that you can see from communicating, evaluating, and so on, to scheduling. And then it's on a spectrum. Now, before I ask you where your culture you think is, which one of these eight scales do you think are most relevant for the coaching profession? Trusting, communicating. Mm -hmm. 
evaluating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which one was the first one? Trusting. Trusting, yeah. Trusting, communicating, evaluating. Yes. Just thinking uh -huh. scheduling as well. <laughs> I was going to... <laughs> Talking from experience, yes, scheduling is very relevant as well, yes. And I would say so, leading. Which one? Leading? Hmm. How does that come in in coaching? Um, I remember a team coaching I was doing, and then at the end, um, it was not in my country, and then at the end, um, the leader of the session said, Anyway, I am the leader, I am the decider. So whatever comes up, I am the one. So this is why I think that leading is also an important part, hierarchical, egalitarian. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I also, can, I, can I make a comment? It's Anna here. I also, looking at, at the, the, the scales, thought that leading was important because um, in coaching, at least as I see it, there is no hierarchy. We are there as equals, as a reflective partner, and 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 there is um, or there is the risk of a of a, a power dynamic that that is unconscious and implicit. So I, I see also these one as relevant. Yes, uh, very good uh, points. Very good. Uh, thank you for your comments. I actually do believe they all play a role in the wider con uh, context somehow down the line. Uh, bias, unconscious bias, and so on. I do also believe there are some that are more important than others. So that's a valid point um, from both of you, Isabel. And sorry, was it Anna? Yeah. Yes, uh, Anna. Anna. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I have a bit of a limited um, overview of the participants. Yes, so thank you for that. Um, and because I was also initially thinking leading, but no, because in coaching we are par, but then there can always be, so indirectly, I would say there can always be this unconscious bias, both from the perspective of the coachee, who actually sees um, a, 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 the coach as a different, on a different level, and also from the coach. Very true. So I would like you to think about where do you think is your, so to make it simple, let, we I'm going to dive, deep dive into communicating, evaluating, and trusting and scheduling. Communicating, evaluating, trusting, and scheduling. Now, I would invite you to think where on this scale is your culture. And while you do that, I'm going to disclose because uh, I, I have just put it's because of time, I cannot put all the countries. Um, so I've just put a comparison between Germany and Kenya. Uh, and because it's so nicely <laughs> opposite of each other. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, yes, so I, I've put that um, for you to see. So you get a little bit of an idea what mapping means. Uh, the scheduling is very interesting. So this is where the left is Germany and the right is Kenya. Um, and mm -hmm. what I can also say is there is a relative distance. So what that means is from looking from Germany to how different Kenyan trades are is a big different. However, from Tanzania to Kenya might be relatively different. So what that means is um, if you now only use those two countries, there might still be a difference, which might be very big. Like that's why a lot of times when um, someone says to me, oh, are you from Austria? And I say, no, I'm from Germany. Uh, oh yeah, but that's same, same. <laughs> you can 
DC, yeah, my my flags go high. Or I rem I remember I cannot get the UK, Britain, England thing straight. Never. I've tried. I've studied. I cannot get it in a box, right? And so whenever I make a comment, or yeah, you guys from England, uh, you guys from Britain, and now. I don't know who, whichever part is not Britain. And the person goes like, no, we're not from Britain. And I would say, but it's all same, same. You know, the offense, the, 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 the outbreak is big. And the same goes for Germany and Holland, for example. From a distance, like from looking from Kenya or from Saudi Arabia onto Germany and Holland, it might be very, very similar. And for someone from Australia, Germany and Austria might just be very similar. But from within there is a difference. So that's what it means to be relatively um, related. Uh, any questions or feedback on what you're seeing? Yeah, go ahead, Isabel. Yes, thank you very much, Rita. Um, it's an observation and correct me if I am wrong, but, um, and I like the mapping, but this is, um it depends of the perception that you have for instance i would say oh belgium they are great in scheduling uh but maybe someone will tell me no we're not that good in that or am i wrong yes so so maybe i should i should go deeper into that there's a yes the, of course we have cultural traits and then personality is always i'm I'm not a German. I'm not German when it comes to scheduling. I'm really a late runner. Um, so it, it, this is based on research and based on majority and based on mm -hmm. I don't know how now research works. Um, if this, if you take a group of X, Y, Z, and then these traits are basically created. Obviously, that doesn't mean everyone is on the same page. We can have Germans who are very bad in scheduling. Um, and we can have Kenyans who are actually very good in scheduling. So that doesn't mean it, it applies because personality, of course, and the way we are raised and so comes on top. And what I also want to say is, um, I forgot that in the beginning, we have cultures that are like cultures of countries and we have organizational culture and our there, I kind of was like, oh, okay, just to make sure I'm talking about country cultures and not organizational culture, which is similar, but different. I mean, um, so even there, you can see, for example, a company in the US has its own culture, even though it's within the US. So that might have his, his, the, its own cosmos, so to say. Um, I hope I'm making sense. Okay, so Mark has put in the chat, I'm further on the right and know that my German friends tell me they would be on the left. Interesting. This will be helpful as I work with clients in Asia. Yes. So Mark, do you want to explain what you mean this will be helpful when, as I, you work with clients in Asia and what particular um, traits are important for you to observe when you work with clients in Asia? I'm going to, I'm going to stop typing here. You caught oh, me. Okay. Yeah, no, sure. that's okay. It's, it's okay, Brita. I'm just joking. The, yeah. um, you know, and I just typed in, I think, uh, just, just from my previous work in Asia and working, you know, doing work in Beijing and different places, just thinking of how I needed to, um, approach different conversations to understand more deeply their way of thinking. And, you know, when it comes to scheduling or comes, it came to um, titles, you know, how important in terms of leadership titles were held and coming from a place like Canada, like, you know, yeah, titles, a title, but it's always for me, it's who are you without the title, but titles were very important um, there. And, um, it's not something that's so important for me here. Um, you know, the hierarchical approach versus egalitarian piece, I think is also an important part because I know the work here in North America, we're trying to go more flat versus the hierarchical leadership, top down 
framework. And um, so it's definitely interesting to take a look at as a coach, how do I show up knowing or being more aware of the context that in their thinking towards um, different ways of being, let's put it that way. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, as I was, um, I've done this presentation before in different contexts and I was reflecting today because um, I was anticipating questions. <laughs> and so I was thinking, so what does it actually mean on how I show up and what I, how far do I change and what do I change where? And, and I'm taking this question now because it fits nicely into what you just said. For me, and it, it, it will always, or how far do you adapt and do you want to adapt before you become someone else? And it's about the awareness um, that we need to be aware of the differences and how beautiful it can be um, that learning from, from those differences. And, and now that you're speaking about North America, I do remember, I think it was someone from Canada where I re referred to because of accent, I thought US and wow. <laughs> It was very clear that was a, a very different um, Canada and US, same as Germany and Austria. And, and in regards of titles, for example, I, I, for me, I'm always so fascinated how two countries who are bordering each other and are so close to each other, who have the same national language, can be so, so different in some things. In Austria, you need to, that's my way of humor, you need to add an extra paper to, to put all the titles. <laughs> I mean, business cards need to be like A5 to put all the titles. And the further north you come in Europe, the less important they become. Like in, in Sweden, it's almost offensive to put your whole lit, like titles that there it's, it's showing off. Yeah, so very good. Um, because of time, sorry, I will I will um, go further. So this is the mapping tool. I'm just showing this because I find this fascinating. You can go into um, uh, Aaron Meyer's uh, the culture map website and pay like $3 or something and then um, uh, do a map of different countries that you're working with and get these maps. So I did this for Germany, Sweden and Kenya because these are the countries I'm associated with. And so you can immediately see um, the, the, the differences in, for example, scheduling, but then where, for example, leading the hierarchy is very much relatively closer between Germany and Kenya because Germany is also still very much traditional and hi hierarchical, but then you can probably imagine my culture shock when I moved from a, a rather hierarchical um, environment, working environment to a total egalitarian environment. I think that was the hardest. I cannot tell you how difficult that was in a working environment, not in a coaching um, environment. Um, so here now we go into the different traits, communicating, and now it gets a bit more beef to the bone, um, low context, high context. Does anyone have an idea what low context and high context means? I would say seeing where France is, high context means that they are communicating a lot, same as Italy, Spain, Mexico, and so on. But I may be completely wrong. It's very difficult. I have to actually remind myself um, and study this because it's uh, not self-explaining, I must say. Uh, high context means um, cultures that have a long history with clues that are inbraided into the culture. Um, I can the, the country that hasn't doesn't have much history is to the left is the US where you have a lot of immigrants and it's a very young country. Uh, I mean, sorry, excuse me when I say immigrants, you probably know what I mean. When you have a very young uh, country where people act, people's actually roots are more from coming from overseas. And so clues have not had so much time to grow as if you now look on the right hand side where Japan is an island. Um, where over time culture has grown and being ingrained into, into the DNA sort of. So in Japan, um, 
people don't need to say it. It's basically the difference between direct communication and indirect communication. She phrases it low context and high context, and she gives that um, um, explanation. Whereas in low context, you will need a lot. It's a bit contradictory. You will need a lot of direct communication and explanation about what you actually mean. So if you speak to someone from those countries, you will get a lot of details. Uh, Germany is one of those countries as well. And if you go to countries like Kenya, Japan, you will read the air or you, you will have to read between the lines because amongst the cultures, amongst themselves, they will immediately understand. Now, for someone from coming outside who hasn't been um, exposed to that culture over a time will be very, very difficult to read what's actually been meant. I'll give you an example. I was working with a Kenyan colleague on and and uh, on a event, and she sent the event poster, and uh, I was supposed to run one of the tables, and it just said, "Yeah, table host Britta," and I was like, "What do you mean, like table host Britta? What do I need to do? Like, what are the instructions? I don't understand." <laughs> so, so she laughed and she said, "Well," and there was another lady from the U.S. and the rest were from Kenya. So she laughed and she said, "The only ones who've actually asked me these questions are you and the person from the U.S." For everyone else, it was kind of like, time will come, I will get my information, and if not, I will just make the best out of it. So this is kind of like the context of where you need it very directly, whereas in other cultures where it's indirect, you, you get you, the context is known without having to explain it. Does that make sense? So, yeah. Um, and then, of course, that might not resonate with you for different reasons, or that might, again, it's not, it's, it's, it's a trait that's not, doesn't maybe apply for everyone. Evaluating, and this is something that I, I think is very important, is how you give direct and indirect feedback. Ah, uh, yes. And now, again, I'm learning the hard way, uh, but then I'm also reflecting on how, how far do I want to drift away from our original culture that is mine. Giving direct negative feedback and indirect negative feedback. So for example, um, people from Holland, I don't know if you've interacted with people from Holland, but even me being from a very close by country, I actually live on the Dutch border. Sometimes I get so shocked at, about the directness. <laughs> like I have to remind myself, okay, Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> um, the directness is, for someone who's not used to it, can be almost offensive. So feedback is given direct, straight if by face value and not softened up. Indirect negative feedback means you're softening it up by, um, is sort of unprofessional, whereas the Dutch would go, this was very unprofessional. Uh, and also, or the, in, in, let me not put it down to judge only, let me put it down to countries who are in that space, um, you would give feedback in front of a group that would be totally um, um, normal, whereas in other countries that are more towards the right, you would give feedback privately. Um, so I just have to... Yeah, so that is basically the difference between direct negative feedback and indirect negative feedback. How is that important in coaching? Well, I'm thinking of um, team coaching, Britta. And what can and can't be said with the team leader in the room in terms of challenging them. And then there's also the other side, supporting them. Mm -hmm. Yes. And now um, I'm getting to you, Lucy, uh, in a minute. And now that you're mentioning team coaching, very true, because if like my experience working here, you will also see a, um, in, a, in a group of people for, in my culture in Germany, if I would do a feedback round secretly and ask them to put it on a paper and put it in the box, it would be completely inappropriate. It's like old school, you don't do that. You put your feedback out in the room so everyone can see. 
In cultures here, you will not get much feedback if you ask someone for feedback in an open room. That's my experience. You will have to protect people and give them the ability to give their feedback privately um, and not in an open room, especially not with hierarchies in the room yet, bosses in the room. Lucy. Thank you. I, I was thinking about um, when appropriate, a coach might offer feedback or an observation in a client. So I've noticed this and I wonder what you make of it. So how that's framed, we might adjust depending on the cultural differences. Um, and also I was thinking about as a coach, when we invite client feedback, evaluation feedback, um, we might get different types of feedback depending on, on the client's culture. Yes. Uh, right. Thank you for that. And how is that in context of the, if you're now looking at the coaching competencies, um, challenging the client moving forward and so on, what needs to be considered when we're looking at, um, sorry, um, indirect and direct negative feedback from a coach perspective? I would say, go on, Isabel. Thank you, Claire. Um, searching to, I would say, searching to understand the experience, the belief, and the culture of the client. One of the yeah. of the first or second competency. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. What else? Thank you. I was thinking about self as instrument and what we're experiencing around delivering that feedback, you know, and also things we might be making up about the other cultures as well. But then also in terms of, um, I was also thinking the new competencies with ITF, the word partners there about 15 times. So, I don't know why, but I'm just playing with, you know, partnering in feedback somehow. Not every culture may be comfortable in that, depending on the hierarchies. Yes, and um, contracting, I saw something in the chat. Sorry, I'm a bit slow reading the chat and listening to all your valuable input. Um, there's something about contracting or agreeing. Um, when we're giving feedback, um, contracting, I usually always contract about my direct communication. And if, if it's okay, like I am not, I am so not diplomatic, so I can't sugarcoat. <laughs> So I, I think that sometimes that's the reason why um, if you if I'm chosen and sometimes that's the reason why I'm not chosen if I'm on the coaching roster, because that's just how it is. Some sometimes direct feedback is not appreciated or hard to 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 digest. Um, so build trust with the client. So I'm just reading the chat, build trust with the client first so that when you challenge the client knows it's from a safe place. Yes. And I've actually had an experience on Sunday where in aftermath, it's about contracting to be challenged and contracting. Is it okay to give direct feedback to you? Or can I, can I reflect what's going on or can I? Yeah. Um, so there it was from Kathy, clear communication for the coach and offering observations and feedback if contracted with a client. And for example, if now what happens if now two coach and coach are from two indirect um, um, communication cultures, then that can go, <laughs> it's very difficult because both don't have the clues and they might have different clues to what's not being said. So it, it's important to be aware that whatever we are saying might not be received in the right way. It's just that awareness that Whatever I'm saying might not be what's being received on the other side of the sending receiving part. Um, sorry, I wanted to go back. Oops, oops. Any questions on this? Any reflections? Yeah. All right. Trust. Trust is on the bottom of the uh, functioning team pyramid and one of the most important um, 
traits in building teams, the fundamentals of teams, and also in coaching. Task-based and relationship-based. Very, very interesting. Uh, anyone who has an idea of what that means? So task-based in terms of getting things done and relationship-based, um, I'm thinking of an experience in Saudi Arabia where it can take six months to actually win a project because so much learning about each other needs to take place and for the trust needs to be there. And then everything just flows really quickly and easily. Um, and if you don't know that, you'd walk away very early on. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I also have a rather funny example. Um, Task-based is you build trust by delivering. So in, sorry, I have to reflect back to Germany, both, uh, I, I, I think in Sweden, it's a bit different. Um, you trust a person um, once you see that person has delivered on time and quality. Uh, and we also separate work from uh, private. We don't talk about how is your family, how is your Sunday, how is your, um, it's, it's very separate. And I know this is in the US as well. And in other cultures that can be offensive, right? Um, so I remember a, a funny incident that I always um, uh, quote from a Kenyan coach, um, colleague where we set up a meeting to go some how we do some marketing and social media and whatever and uh, me I'm thinking okay we have half an hour let's go right in I'm like uh, you know okay so we you know the meeting starts and I'm like yeah and so today we were going to discuss this and this and this <laughs> the other person was like but Britta hold on a second I need to know how you are first. And don't you want to know how I am? And I'm like, okay, I forgot that piece. <laughs> so that, that was a great reminder of, and, and what's interesting for us, it's not so much that we are not interested. It's much about, it's more like the, the um, narrative that goes out uh, in our mind is, let me not take too much of your time so that you can actually go and get to the results, right? It's not so much I'm not interested in your personal life or how you are. And now I've also learned in my emails, and I'm please take this with a pinch of um, humor. Um, I hope your week has started off well. I hope you, you know, in Germany, we just go straight, you know, getting back this is you know this is what we've achieved this is what's done these are the challenges there is no such thing like how is your week going uh, how are you it it just doesn't exist most of the time i don't know if you some of you can re resonate with that um it's just very different and the other thing is and i don't know if you um have ever been i think mark you said you've been interacting with asia and for example in japan I worked for a Japanese company for for quite some time, and um, you relate you 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 have to go out and have some karaoke. I can't say the word. You know what I mean? The singing bit, karaoke, whatever that kind of music thing where you go out and and sing, and then you go back into the office. And uh, in Russia, if you don't drink vodka, you're not making any business. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm exaggerating, but it's the relationship part, and I'm experiencing this here um, with the projects on the ground with the Maasai cultures, where it takes years. You need to build those relationships, and it's always like, no, Britta, but we need to meet again, and we need to meet again, and we need to meet again, and nothing is happening. And what's also coming up for me now, it's not even the national um, culture as such. Of course, you can even ha have different communities. Kenya has 42 different communities and each of those communities has a different culture. And then there are different clans. And I think that is very similar in some of the Middle Eastern um, countries as well. So each and then it gets very complex. Yeah, so that's... Um, that is meant with task-based and relationship-based. In relationship-based cultures, you can only start working and building trust after the relationship has actually been built. That means 
going out with the families, going out in the evening, sharing private um, stories, um, and so on. Really, that's very important. Any experiences or questions on that? And I have to say, I have a funny example from the US. You know, when I first went uh, to the US at, at a teenage age and I went shopping and everywhere I went, I was I was greeted with like, oh, what's your name? Yeah, my name is this and this. And, you know, and I was thinking like, have I met this person? <laughs> Remember exactly. I can't remember meeting this person. How do I know this person? Just to understand that in every shop, everything is like almost like you have met this person before. You you know that person. Um, it's completely different from where when you go shopping in, in, in a European culture, you're basically nicely left alone to see if there's anything you want. Yeah, so that's just an anecdote from that experience. Now, um, I'm not going to spend so much time here because um, we're running out of time and it's not, it, it is of course also important, but not so important because we're not really disagreeing and agreeing. Um, well, sometimes we are, uh, but I thought it was interesting, emotionally experienced, interesting to know, especially when you do team coaching, because if you have a mixed ball of fruits in the room, um like I had on Sunday <laughs> and you you will know that emotionally expressive is very different from unexpressive so it's a bit similar Japan is known for being um very emotionally unexpressive not showing any emotions keeping cool uh, and uh, cultures like Russia or India are more emotionally expressing you you have you, you you shout it out or not shout it out you're expressing your emotions and then there's confrontation and avoid confrontation so you you can already think about because now these bullets will spread into horizontal now see um is yeah Netherlands and the European countries are more like unexpressive we're more holding holding our emotions that are, are cool and then the Mediterranean are more up here um, Saudi Arabia is here US is pretty much half half <laughs> so now the interesting part is how that evolves into the four quadrants where um, you can be emotionally unex, and that's a very interesting thing. You can be uh, having your cool, but still be very confrontational, and that's what the culture is that I am from. We like to argue, but that we we that means we are splitting the person from the argument. So we can disagree with a person, but that doesn't mean we don't like that person. And in con and that is something that is very different from the culture I'm living in, for example. So in Israel, you're very, um, in Russia and France, Spain, you're very expressive, but you're also very confrontational. So that is a double in, in the way it goes out into countries, whereas in Japan, which is on the opposite here, highly avoid conflict, conflict avoiding and emotionally unexpressive. What does that mean in coaching? Cultures. for example, from Japan, or what, what do we need to be aware of as a coach? Considering listening beyond words. Mm -hmm. And checking in on what we're noticing around that. And yes, great. And how about uh, moving forward, challenging the client? How is that connected to avoiding confrontation? Or where that, where does this come in? Uh, I have. I'm just reading out loud a comment that um, I'm seeing from Mark, which I totally agree. Um, so much feels like it goes back to creating the alliance and coaching agreement and the conversation and how we agree to work together. That is very true. And that is also my reflection from my um, experience I had recently 
where I'm like, okay, let's go back to the agreement. What did we agree on and what did we forget to agree on? Um, yeah, very true. The, the question is how much is it possible to agree? And there's so much, I mean, we're already almost talking about this for an hour. Um, how much is possible to agree on and how much detail? That's always the question, where's the balance? ICF competency on, uh, on evokes awareness, shares observation to support new learning, need to consider how this is done. Um, my sense is that this has shifted in UK on this in particular hybrid working and more appetite for connection. I wonder if mirrored in other places with more task orientation. That's from Lucy. <clears throat> yeah, okay, you, Mark, you were referring to the indigenous communities, um, group coaching. Um, yeah, ex especially the complexity of group supervision where there's the coach and the culture and then their clients. Yeah, that is also when you have teams who are very much from international um, cultures. Yes, Mark, considering remote virtual teams and the challenges they have. Yeah, very much so when you cannot really see the full body and, and, and so many different challenges. Mark, you have your hand raised. Please go ahead. Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, looking at this and, you know, avoids confrontation, both from an emotionally expressive or unexpressive state. It makes me wonder if, as coaches, stepping into this right hand side here of avoiding confrontation is i wonder how it impacts as as a coach in terms of what questions am i not asking as a result of being aware and what potentially the impact that has with the client you know, yes taking yes, into but... context their their cultural context and am yeah. i really in service to them by not asking those questions. Very true. So interesting, I can only also again speak from me, even though I come from a confrontational um, society and I like arguing, um, I'm also a conflict avoider for different scenarios. So I the, the question of what are the questions we're not asking, but also when you have a coachee in front from a culture that is more from an indirect or from a conflict avoiding and not so expressive um, culture. What is that doing to you as a coach? Does that impact you? Or are you like considerate of that? Is, is, is that holding you back? So yeah, I totally agree. These are the questions I ask myself sometimes. How direct can I be? when I know the coach she is coming from a very indirect culture do I still stick to my like what comes up for me immediately and you know use of self or do I tune that down which is what you meant earlier um, Dr. Claire when you were talking about use of self which is th the most authentic and I believe for me that's probably the most when my culture comes through when I kind of sense something and I want to just you know <laughs> where does the filter come in and should it come in that's the question I'm asking should it come in or should it not come in what's your view I think it depends on agreement with client. Mm -hmm. And so then I'm also thinking about um, group coaching here when people are, you know, it's eclectic and team coaching and then the complexity of group supervision where you've got the coaches being supervised but also their clients are in the room 
and they may be from different cultures again. It gets complex. And, and, and that, what that brings up to me is especially for supervision where you also um, are allowed to give advice and feedback so that the feedback component comes in very much. Okay, let me, um, because we only have a few minutes left, I wanted to just go into the scheduling. I think we are all aware of this uh, trait and how this can be very, very different. So we have the clockmakers, Germany and Switzerland on the left-hand side, which are very much um, linear. Like uh, what that means, linear and flexible, I'm, I'm explaining that um, because of time. Linear means you, do task um, after each other. Like you finish one task before you start the next task. And I find this very fascinating because now understanding, um, when I moved to Kenya, obviously uh, scheduling and timing was a, a very much a challenge for me. And it still sometimes is, um, depending on the context you're working in. But a flexible uh, a timing in, in these cultures has a reason. It, because often, you, you know, life, or hits the fan, uh, more often, like there is power cut, there's this roads are inaccessible and yada, yada. So in these cultures, you need to be more agile to adopt and uh, tasks are done simultaneously, whatever comes up is done and then change and whatever life brings at you is taken and then you know re resumed later. So that's what's meant with flexible. Um, tasks are taken in a different way. And of course, things are changing, especially uh, depending on the country but especially now also with um, online uh, work a remote and online work that's basically the reason which very much now makes me understand much better because I'm often in a similar situation where I'm like today I had no power and where I'm like oh you know, so then things get challenging, yeah, or like there's traffic jams, of course, you can always, there's always traffic jams, but it's different, it's it's different from countries where that are more linear, which are more like you see the Western cultures, whereas more cultures like Brazil, um, Kenya, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, infrastructure is a bit different, so that's one of the reasons. Yeah. And so now we're coming to the end and I would like to ask you, so there's a question in the chat. I'm wondering if there's also value in sharing instruments, Kilman conflict instrument. Okay, I think it depends on agreement with, I'm not, um, I'm not aware of that instrument. Um, maybe Lucy, you can explain. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a self-assessment instrument. It's Thomas Kilman, and it looks at people's uh, conflict styles and when do they compromise, avoid, compete, etc. And I just thought it's um, it, it's a, an insight tool, really, so people can look at what where is their preference and where is their mileage in adopting different types. So, so in a team coaching scenario, um, it might be something if they felt like they were struggling to have constructive conflict. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. I also wanted to share with the, the tools. There are different tools. I should also say Philip Rosinski and uh, Get Hofstede are very much in the front line together with Erin Mayer on research on cultural differences. Um, they all have different frameworks, as you can imagine. And also Get Hofstede had, it works, they, they also work with company cultures and you can go onto the website and ditch in your countries and get different um, Hope Data works with six traits, different maps and explanations. And I believe on Erin Meyer's website, you can get a personal profile, like not only on your country, but on your person. So there are all these different tools that are very, very interesting. I really encourage you to, to this book was like, it was so funny and entertaining. Um, I really loved it. So I think we have reflected a lot as we went along on the traits that my original plan was to have a breakout sessions but with uh, 13 people in the room I think we can do the reflection in the room and we've already done most of it so in what ways are these traits important in coaching I think we've touched based on most of that scheduling obviously <laughs> is important um, when it comes to scheduling appointments 
And, and what are some of your experiences in regards of, I've shared a lot um, in regards of these traits that come up while we've been talking. Thinking also in terms of, um, you know, um, getting clients. And there was once when I was in person and someone was quite offended in the Middle East because they gave me their business card and I looked at it and I put it on the table. And one reason I did that was there was a few people in the room to make sure I used the correct name because it was the first time I'd met them. Um, and I was told the work was won, and then I was told afterwards, um, you nearly lost this project because that should have gone into your bag. I never knew that at all. And so it's really ongoing learning when things happen on certain occasions that, you know, are brand new, even though you've lived in a culture for a long time. Exactly. Thank you for sharing that. Sorry, which, which culture was this? That was in Bahrain at the time, so Arab culture, although these cultures within cultures as well, isn't there? Yes, 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 that's very important too, yes, it's, it, it really is. I mean, even in, in, you know, we have Bavaria and the rest of Germany. <laughs> um, any other um, experiences you want to share that come up for you? That was a very interesting experience, but thank you for sharing, Claire. Isabel, you have so seen so many cultures. What was the uh, first experience for you in terms of cultures? Um, it was reading the yes, especially in Asia. And now I'm thinking about uh, Myanmar, Birmanie. Uh, my colleague told me, yes, I can do it. I was believing that. And so I was always wondering why it's not done. Afterwards, I uh, I understood, but uh, well, uh, the meaning of a yes is uh, for me an experience when you have uh, a cross culture, when you are working across culture. Yep. Yes, that is, uh, sorry, I just want to make sure, Claire, in my, um, in my timing, I have until a quarter two, is that the case or are we stopping at the half of the hour? Sorry. So it was scheduled an hour and 15, um, so totally up to you. Some people do have to drop off the start in their work day and so forth. Sure. So I'll go on for those who are interested in sticking around. Thank you, Isabel, for sharing that. That's a great, that's a great experience when a yes is not necessarily yes. Yeah. And when um, saying no is, of, those cultures were saying no is offensive or when, <laughs> when you ask for directions and you just completely lost in the bush because the person didn't want to say that he doesn't know and he just gave you whatever directions. <laughs> great, great example. When a yes, reading the yes, yep. All right. What are ways, what are key ways of navigating these differences? We've already had some of them um, and most important is um, contracting, of course. Um, what are most important in navigating these differences? I guess uh, Rita is Anna here again. Uh, the best thing is to is to raise awareness that there is this cultural element uh, that eventually can get in the way without being aware of it. And so, inviting uh, uh, a reflection on on these and and then contracting, trying to contract uh, and and bring you know the core construct the alliance and, 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 and the relationship so that we, we are more aware of our bias and of our assumptions and yeah, and 
and um, not imposing also a way of being and a way of, of um, uh, experience the world um, that can go against the values of, of, of our client and, and, and vice versa. So is, is this transparency, this, um, and, and, and again, transparency, it, you know, <laughs> um, again, I, 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 I am aware that I, I'm biased by also my culture and who I am, right? Because there is here a, a cultural component and also a personality component. Uh, but yes, I would say is is bring this uh, to awareness and 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 you know uh, educate ourselves and try to um, invite our clients also to educate themselves. Yeah, great feedback. Thank you, thank you, um, thank you, Anna. What for for one of the things that I um, keep because I've been doing this cultural thing for many, many years that I keep encouraging is stay curious and behold judgment. And it comes back to bias. Um, and it's the hardest for me before we get into, for example, when it becomes to scheduling and you, you already like I get angry or frustrated or when it comes to saying yes and then it's not done, stay curious uh, and explore um sometimes you will not always find but that's the coaching skills staying curious and exploring and then the most important i think is listening which which are the key coaching um skills yeah i think so um it also goes beyond coaching i mean i i've had clients who bring in cultural challenges and then it's for like you said earlier claire it's for for my coach client but also how he then operates his teams in different cultures yeah yeah thank you so much any other thoughts feedback vulnerability from us sharing our not knowing yes Yes, the being comfortable in the not knowing. Mm -hmm. And I would add, when you say listening, is is listening to the nonverbal, to the whole system of the client. Yes. This is the key, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yeah, if there are no, yeah, time flew. This is a topic that can be very extensive. Um, so it's hard to keep it short. Any other um, reflections, questions, input? Well, Britta, on behalf of us all, thank you so much. It was extremely um, in depth, really useful information and thank you for giving up your time clearly preparing extremely well and um, sharing your learning the stories are really interesting as well aren't they yeah I I must say I keep uh, I keep a journal <laughs> for all my experiences are reflecting on it it's uh, it becomes quite interesting thank you so much for joining um and uh, yeah, I thank you for listening and for being here and being present and your input, all your valuable input. Um, hope to see you soon. Thank you. And just mm -hmm. to share, we've got um, two more things this month. We've got a session for those people who have co-delivered and there'll be a session next month for people who haven't. So uh, co-delivering, whether it's group coaching or team coaching, co-delivering supervision. And um, it's a generative space to share best practice. We've got two people from the fabulous Parachute Project who work with um, CTI leaders on their in-between project where you are thrown together with someone you don't know and you learn together on co-delivery. Um, and then we've also got, I'm doing a demonstration, a uh, little 20, 30 minute information share on just old themes and then a demonstration of the empty chair technique. So um, they're all on the website. I'll put the link in the chat. 
and there's some more going on this week we've got sessions all the way to the end of the year uh, there'll be more demonstrations there'll also be which seem to be um really useful for people we share coaching sessions and then there's live mentor coaching for that coach so we'll do more of those during the year as well yeah those are very valuable i can only encourage you to join those all of them and thank you all for thank coming you. Mm. have a fabulous evening day and it's yeah. good night nearly bedtime for me <laughs> same here yeah, yeah thank you good night Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you. Bye.